Today we're interviewing Mary Drummond, um, a dear colleague of mine, um, an incredible mover, a very intentional, dynamic mover. Um, I'm very excited about this because he's someone who's very good at not only articulating his body, but he's incredibly um, pragmatic and he's very good at articulating the use of the body. So I thought he would be a fantastic person to talk to. Hi, Barry. Hi, Fresh. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. I love the hair. Oh, thank you. Because he's not very happy with it. He's like, oh, really? He's actually been really busy. So he's not had a lot of time to experiment. So since we did this kind of champagne -y gray color, like day one of lockdown, and it's been like two months and we haven't touched it since. So I think maybe this week we'll do something else. Oh, exciting. I love it. Yeah. You look so um, edgy and, you know, exhausted. Oh, <laughs> I want to pick your brain. I want, I want people to know about the Drummond Method. The Drummond Method. The Drummond yeah, Method. Yeah. Could you give us a quick little overview about where you're from, like where you trained and like a little overview of your career? Yeah. Um, so I'm from Scotland originally. I grew up in a, a small town uh, called Callander in the central belt of Scotland. Um, there's not a whole lot going on there. It's a gorgeous little town, um, but not a huge lot going on, particularly in terms of kind of performing arts. Um, so I started with like Highland dancing when I was really, really young um, and started ballet when I was uh, 12. I did like ballet, tap, jazz, the whole, the whole shebang. Um, but really just as a hobby. Um, and then when I was 16, I, I moved down, I got a place at the Royal Ballet Upper School by some miracle. I mean, that audition was just a car crash. I was <laughs> at the front and I was clinging onto the bar, looking behind me the whole time because I couldn't pick up the exercises. It was just, but I think they just saw that I had a massive smile on my face and that I was super keen. So they're like, okay, let's just give them a chance. Um, <laughs> Yes, yeah, so then I trained at the, the upper school for three years. Um, and then from there, I got my contract with ENB. And I've been with them now for 10 years. Yeah. Mm. So it's been, okay. yeah, it's been a big chunk of time with ENB. Um, and I've learned a lot. I've been really lucky. I've done lots of, lots of different rep, um, some nice kind of featured soloist principal stuff as well. Um, yeah. But I mean, 10 years, everyone says, you know, that patronizing comment when you join the company, go, oh, you know, time goes really fast. And 18 year old me was like, yeah, right. You've got no idea what you're talking about. And then 10 years on, I find myself saying the same things like, oh my goodness, it really, really does go fast. I know. <laughs> so, yeah. It's been a good it's 10 crazy. years, I have no regrets. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I miss it all like so much. It's crazy when it like, when it's taken away from you yeah really quickly and unexpectedly like my god am i aware of like how much it like gave me purpose in life yeah. like <laughs> as much as yes it's a pandemic and it's very serious there is this really tiny element of excitement like oh this is kind of it's a part of history this is the kind of thing people are going to talk about and it's a big change to your kind of day-to-day -day life how am i going to adapt to this and sort of my initial thought my inner introvert was going hallelujah I'm gonna have loads of time at home. I'm not gonna to have to see anybody and deal with other people's emotions <laughs> that they project into the world. I'm gonna be so happy all on my own, just me and my boyfriend at home chilling out. Mm. And actually, I did, quite quickly, I did grow to miss um, human interaction. And it's something I thought, I, you know, oh, I think I'll be fine without it. But actually, yeah, I'm, yeah, I do, I do miss, you know, feeding off other people's energy and. Um, how's your isolation been going? Or do you have like a routine that you do on a daily basis? How has it been going? Um, I sort of, I've, I've tried numerous times to make some kind of routine and it just, as much as I think I have kind of a loose routine through the week, it sort of changes. Um, I spend my mornings doing kind of my kind of movement, motion is lotion-y kind of stuff just to kind of wake up nice and gently. I also really realize I'm not a, I've never really been a, mo a morning person, but I've realized I'm really, really not a morning person when I don't have that um, immediate necessity to get out of bed and be productive straight away. I really, really mm -hmm. take my time. Um, I'll spend a good few hours kind of, you know, slowly starting that engine. There's none of this out of bed, get ready, do a ballet class straight away. No, it doesn't really happen like that for me. Um, so I'm, <laughs> yeah, I really take my time, mainly kind of motions, lotion kind of stuff just to get my body moving, loads of floor bar, 
Um, oh, okay. Um, like your own floor bar or have you been taking someone's um, floor bar? Bits and pieces. Um, there's a woman who, um, she was a dancer at EMB. And when I first joined the company, she was responsible for all the rehab. Um, and she had learned uh, a kind of a version of floor bar from this amazing lady called Maria. Um, so she, as she's been doing Zoom classes um, on Monday. So I've been doing those and then doing bits of that through the week on my own. Um, as well as the Norwegian National Ballet, I've been posting so much content the whole of lockdown. Um, and their floor bar is really good as well. Uh, kind of in the afternoons, I'll do a proper, um, a proper class, either normally on my own, to be honest. I've been enjoying mm -hmm. giving myself class. Um, I just find it's, you, you know, no one knows your own body better than you do. So I've been quite enjoying just kind of taking my time and doing what I think and know that I need and working mm -hmm. at my own pace. Um, but then also, you know, dipping in and out of, you know, every man and his dog at the moment is offering classes. So it's great. There's so many to choose from. Um, mm. Yeah, but I mean, it's just, I don't think I've ever done so much like yoga and Pilates and just like really like holistic, take your time, be kind to your body. And, you know, you can still build yeah. strength and stamina, but in a really mindful way when that kind of the pressure element of, okay, I have this performance coming up or this person's coming in to cast for whatever, you know, this, that's all just been eliminated. So it's quite nice to work in a, a totally pressureless environment. I've noticed quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of carryover into my, into my body and into my mental health. But when you eliminate that pressure element, you can get amazing results from your body. And that, mm. yeah, I, I miss the pressure of preparing for performance and all that kind of stuff. But in terms of, you know, tuning in and looking after your, your instrument, actually, it's been really nice to have um, all the time I could possibly ask for and more. So, yeah, I've definitely been feeling the same benefit. Um, could you tell us about some people who you admire, people, dancer, public figure? I find, dancer-wise, I find it really hard, mainly because I've been in the same company for 10 years and you kind of grow, I think you kind of subconsciously grow to look at people with much kinder eyes when you really know them as people. And of course I grow to admire those kinds of people because you know them so well and their performances mean a lot more to you. So I find it quite hard to name um, kind of dancers and stuff. At EMB, I mean, even people that are allergic to hard work have no choice but to work hard. So I admire anyone <laughs> that manages even a season or two at EMB. It is a it is a brilliant place to work, but it is hugely taxing to, to, to work there um, for any number of years. It's a really difficult, so I admire anyone who spends even a season at EMB because you really, you really find out what you're made of um, to mm. be able to survive a season there just because the workload is, is heavy um, and it presents lots of opportunities, but it is, it's very, very, um, it's tough. So I think anyone, I admire anyone who can survive in that kind of situation. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a difficult question. I don't, I don't know, I don't know. That's all right. Um, I know, I know before. exactly what I know exactly what you mean. Um, E and B, that didn't they say we did like 140 performances, um, in the past 12 months or something? So I want you to tell us about how, like, you have learned to cope with not only our workload, but as a dancer, you've uh, developed this this thing called like motion is lotion. What is that about? What is like the mind body connection about to Mr. Drummond? I have, this is where I get to like properly geek out. I've had quite a, um, a colored past with injuries, let's say, um, and had had to sort of out of necessity learn quite a lot about the body. Um, and I had a period of time where I was kind of having repetitive problems and putting in a lot of work and still not getting anywhere close to being pain free and, and moving well um, and grew really, really frustrated. Um, so started to look down kind of various avenues of different uh, movement disciplines. And I was sort of ended up in one of, you know, you're scrolling Instagram and you just go from page to page to page to page. And I sort of got into this well of like movement professionals um, and started to discover like, really interesting stuff that I'd never really seen before through the kind of um, ballet rehab with like Pilates and gym work. There was a lot, whole lot of stuff that was really new to me. And I thought, okay, no, I, 
with all my injuries, I must have seen pretty much all there is to offer. And I really hadn't. There was a whole um, branch of kind of like mobility training and stuff out there that I hadn't come across yet. Hashtag motion is lotion. And it just instantly resonated with me. I thought, ah, oh, that makes so much sense that, you know, days where I feel stiff and sore and kind of the temptation is to get a foam roller and just, you know, pummel every bit of soft tissue in your whole body to try and make you feel better. And actually it's a really, um, it's a very short term solution and actually you'll end up, it's just kind of a continuous cycle where you don't really get a lot of long-term carryover. Um, and so, so I started adopting um, these principles about trying to work more with movement to kind of heal your body and get where you wanted to get rather than kind of passive modalities like having physio or having massage, which are, um, can work excellent, excellently in tandem with some kind of movement therapy and um, functional rehab. Um, so yeah, so I started looking down this kind of route about using movement to, to fix my problems. And so things that were bothering me, like a joint that I felt like didn't move as well as the other side or a movement that I found painful, or if I was working a lot and I just felt kind of heavy and stiff and I did have that kind of inner temptation to go, okay, I'm gonna lie on a foam roller or a spiky ball or, and actually discovered the more that I would kind of remove that temptation and work with movement, I discovered actually less and less I was having the need to think about, oh, maybe I need to roll this out or stretch this out. And actually, if you prioritize good good movement, and I, by that I don't mean um, just the movements you need for, for ballet. I mean, your, your skeleton is designed, most people's skeleton are designed perfectly and they crave maximum movement. They want to move every single joint they have in all the potential um, ranges that, are, that are available in this in kind of your factory settings. And so as soon as I started to, do, to work with that and you know, not just um, recreating movement I would need for dancing and just get full range of every joint that I could possibly access, I just slowly started to feel my body just start to be so much more cooperative. Um, and I was fighting a lot less um, and having to spend a lot less time um, in the gym doing strength stuff and doing, you know, countless repetitions of exercises to isolate different muscle groups. As soon as I started to think about the body as kind of one global unit that actually um, all these joints and muscles and tend that they, it all has to work collaboratively. They all have to cooperate with one another as one big chain to really get the results you want. You can isolate Yes, each um, muscle and whatever has to be strong in its own right, but that strength can only be applied if the whole chain is working well. And in order to do that, often you have to look really far away from where the problem is. If you've got something in your shoulder, you know, it's just, it's, I mean, it's totally beyond my comprehension and kind of black and white terms, but the gist of it is that actually whatever problem you have, it will have, it has this kind of ripple effect through the body so you really have to address the body as a global unit and actually isolating certain muscles and joints is only so useful. There's, um, is there's a much bigger picture at play that you have to address if you really want um, proper long-term carryover. Yeah, so that's kind of a not so brief <laughs> summary of motion as lotion. So you touched on so many things that um because I've been trying to explore the mind body connection myself, but it all came from the things that you've spoken about the idea of like thinking globally about the body. And when you have a pain in your knee, it's like, it's not isolated at your knee. It could be stemming from your hip and your back. And what could you tell us? Um, Cause I remember the first time I even heard this, this whole idea was from Helen. Mm -hmm. um, I know that she gives you also a lot of, um, inspiration that's helped to feed the Drummond method. Um, could you perhaps talk a little bit more about the way that certain bits connect through our our body? You use the you use the word cog a lot. Yeah, I do. I love the word cog. <laughs> um, so um yeah we were really lucky at EMB for a long time. There was an amazing um our sort of official title was um soft tissue therapist called um Helen Wellington. Um, who sort of started her journey with um, massage, anatomy, anatomy physiology, um, and later went on to do yoga. 
but most recently, I think maybe three or four years ago, um, she studied with a guy called Gary Ward. Um, and he wrote a book called What the Foot? Um, and he runs a course where he teaches um, his, his own kind of um, movement discipline, I guess you'd call it, um, which is called the flow motion model. Um, and I think the course is called Anatomy in Motion. Um, so this guy, uh, his work kind of centers around the feet um, and how the feet um, being the kind of the thing that's most connected to the ground um, have quite a profound effect on what happens further up the skeleton. He started as a, a, ski, boot a ski boot fitter like that. So he knew about the body and just became fascinated with feet. And he was fitting ski boots and putting kind of, um, I guess you could call them kind of like orthotics that he made himself when people were complaining about knee pain or back pain when they were skiing. And he was fascinated by how he could adjust something inside the ski boots and eliminate that pain. And this began his journey of really beginning to study the feet. Um, your feet have um, 26 bones in each foot um, and in each foot there are 33 joints. Um, and if you think about the number of joints and bones you have further up the skeleton, it's a lot is in the feet. I mean, that's 52 bones in both feet and you only have 206 in the whole body. So a quarter of your bones are in your feet. And actually a lot of ballet rehab, you will do um, you do a lot of foot exercises, you do the, like the intrinsics and the towel grabs and actually that's only really getting the metatarsals but the, the most complicated bit of the foot is kind of where the shin um, comes down to meet all of the bones in the midfoot and the heel which connect to the metatarsals. If you, if you can have a look at like a, a foot skeleton, it's so intricate and they all move in three dimensions. So he designed this movement um, therapy and you use these like, you have these like cool wedge things that you can use. These are like my best friends. I take them everywhere. <laughs> um, and there's a, whole, like, there's a whole series of movement you can do um, to encourage um, what he says. You're, you're basically trying to find center. So your feet um, are designed to be able to pronate and supinate. And that's become, especially pronate has become kind of a dirty word, um, particularly in the ballet rehab world, because I think it's a bit misunderstood. So foot pronation is when, if you imagine your foot is kind of, imagine this is my foot kind of in neutral. Um, mm -hmm. Actually, I'll use this hand. So if this is like your, your big toe down to the little toe, when you mm -hmm. take a step and you put weight into the leg, um, you want the whole foot to kind of flatten and splat onto the ground. And that's mm -hmm. different from the ankle and the shin rolling inside. Of course, when you have this sort of flattening of the foot, the knee and the shin will point closer towards the big toe, but it doesn't mm -hmm. roll all the way in. And um, so it's about this like flattening of all five metatarsals and all these bones and the feet flattening towards the ground to absorb load. And then as you take off from even just from a footstep, then they all start to peel back off and you get this kind of like lifted arch supinated shape. And you need to have the heel, the big toe knuckle and the little toe knuckle in contact with the floor and throughout both of those um, uh, movements. So you're trying to open up pronation and supination. Um, so you get both directions to be able to let your feet rest in neutral so that you can then access both so that your feet um, kind of open and close and, the, and it acts like a, a trampoline or a shock absorber um, for all kinds of, um, for force, just walking, running, jumping, all that kind of stuff. So Helen is the one who passed this um, kind of method on to me. Um, and mm -hmm. so I, I work with her a lot. I do, um, she's designed the most incredible, um, they're like yoga classes. They, call, they incorporate a lot of yoga, but she also has incorporated a lot of um, Gary Ward's anatomy and motion stuff. So she's got this class that's so incredible for dancers because it really um, kind of, switches the lights on in your brain about how much the feet have to move and mm -hmm. actually you can do as many of those kind of towel grab and doming exercises as you like all you're doing is generating kind of stiffness under the foot and yes you do need kind of strength for that in ballet but you also need your feet to to soften and flatten to absorb load mm -hmm. um and yeah this whole method uh, it relates into how this then affects 
shock absorption further up the body and how your pelvis, your rib cage, and your skull can move independently, but the movements also um, have to be connected again for you to find center. So you can stick the bottom out, open the ribs to the front and tuck the chin and then mm -hmm. put the ribs back, tuck the pelvis under and open the throat. So that each one is kind of, kind of on its own little kind of um, like rotisserie, if you imagine. And but, so they all sync up, but they all work individually too, so that you open the extremity of each direction to then rest right in the middle. And you can do it um, in the sagittal plane, so like forward and back in the frontal plane, so kind of side to side and transverse plane, which is twisting. So it's totally 3D. And then you, once you've opened up um, all of those movements in all those directions, you hopefully then come back to find somewhere close to your center, um, which is, I mean, sort of useful and necessary for people from all walks of life, not just dancers. I've noticed a lot of um, carryover. And then when I do come to ballet, I find that my feet are, you know, when teachers talk about your feet being really connected to the ground, um, it's something I never... I did understand it, but I don't think as profoundly as I do now with it. When I, when I really stand in first position, that first exercise at the bar, I really feel like I've got really generous contact with the floor between my heel, my pinky toe, and my big toe. I've got quite a lot of the foot in contact with the floor. And I do have, I can have nice feet in the ballet world. So there it's kind of a, a lifted arch and kind a of supinated shape. But actually I've been able to get closer to center, which is actually having more of the foot on the floor and I've not mm -hmm. lost any of my, my kind of points, pointing ability. Mm -hmm. But it just means when I stand, I'm much more connected to the ground. And then all, you know, my, my knees and my hips and everything, they all just bend with so much more ease. And I don't have to kind of pull myself into my first any plies or, um, you know, really actively kind of have to push away to get back up. It all just happens so much more organically and your body will start to work like a, like a spring. Mm. Um, so that's kind of, Again, a not so brief, but actually brief um, summary of um, what I've been doing with um, with Helen, which is through the the Gary Ward kind of method. Um, mm. Yeah, it's it is complicated to understand, but I think even if you just try and grasp kind of a simple concept of it and start to put it into practice, you notice um, a lot of carryover into the into the body and how organically your your body starts to move. Mm. Another thing that you often touched on was um, active stretching um, instead of passive yeah. stretching, because that was something I always struggled with um, before I came to ENB, because I'd, like, I'd never really had proper physio Pilates in terms of accessing the full function of um, like mind-body connection, Pilates, intrinsic muscles, um, being aware of the chain of how everything connects, whether it's landing from a jump or doing a demi-plie. Um, and... The, the use of the whole body, but you talk about active stretching because I was someone who, you know, I sit in over splits and I have like these, and it's just, it gets loose and there wasn't, but I couldn't lift my legs high. So that's another thing that I thought the active stretching was really interesting. Could you touch on that a little bit? Um, so, um, yeah? I guess that incorporates um, a couple of things. Um, Oops, sorry. I mean, firstly, um, I'm sure people are going to hate me saying this. Passive stretching doesn't work. <laughs> it, gives you, <laughs> it gives you temporary length in, the, in tissue, but in movement, your muscles function with like an on, off, on, off, on, off, on, off kind of um, system. And they, they lengthen and shorten and, and kind of in accordance with what, you're, what the joint is doing at that time. Um, and I guess it also comes back to um, so one of the things in Gary's book, What the Foot, and I don't, I don't think he was the first person to, um, to kind of say this, but it's, I discovered it reading his book. There's a kind of a, there's a, a, a chain, I guess, um, about teach, teaching your body things. Um, and at the bottom of that chain, you have um, like muscles um, and then joints, and then the fascial system, uh, and then the whole body, and then the nervous system, and then at the very top you have the brain. And basically, in terms of getting results, you're better mm -hmm. off training the brain, because if you train the brain, you train everything in that list underneath. 
And if you train the nervous system, you train everything under that and under that and under that. So everything you're training, prioritize training your brain because actually that's responsible for, ev for everything, for all movement. And it all comes, whether consciously or subconsciously, comes from your brain. So with things like stretching, if you're stretching in order to try and lift your legs higher, you can lengthen those tissues by passive stretching all you like your brain has to understand that it's safe and that your body and tissues are capable of actively getting into that position. So if you don't work actively into that range of motion that you need, your brain will never free up the space for you to be able to get there. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure a lot of people are going, oh, I've spent my whole career passive stretching and it's always worked for me. I'm sure it's that you passive stretch and then at some point, whether in class, you then use active movement to get there. That's what's made the difference. Yeah, basically when I talk about active stretching, it's more that I'm trying not to teach my hamstrings or my calves or anything at that moment. I'm trying to teach my brain that I need those movements and that it's safe for me to move into that range of motion. And then slowly, incre incrementally, mm -hmm. you can build up how far you go or you know, experiment with adding a bit of load. Um, you know, people like that sit in, in over, in over splits. I'm not saying mm -hmm. don't ever do that. I mean, of course, do it safely, but you're better off if you can find kind of something that you can kind of slip on and then mm -hmm. slowly let yourself, you know, pull your feet to together and then actively let them reach further away so that you're, you're engaged in the position and you're not just letting yourself soften into, into that range. So you're, mm -hmm your brain has got a chance to go, oh, okay, I can do this and it is safe. I know I do have a bit more space and you'll go and go and go and go. And then you're actively getting into those ranges of motion mm. and you don't get that. Because um, what happens if you then are kind of throwing yourself into those ranges of motions when you're dancing, taking class or doing rep or whatever, if you've not worked into them safely in a controlled environment, what happens is if you then throw yourself into them in an uncontrolled environment like class or, or rep, that's when your body you'll have like an auto kind of um, protective response where it will contract muscles quite severely to stop you from getting into that range but if you've already thrown your whole weight into doing something it'll have no choice and it'll you'll end up getting there but something else will give you extra movement to make you think you've achieved what you're going for but actually it's maybe mm -hmm. something else has moved to give you that movement mm. um and it's stuff mm. that you wouldn't even realize the body is in incredibly smart you know you can be missing movement in a in a in some kind of uh, motion for years and your body will find ways um to efficiently solve that problem and it might be that you don't ever your bo body might not be able to put the movement back into where it needs but it will find movement from somewhere else yeah um, and compensate the, on another part of your body yeah which is when you then end up with things like i discovered recently i hit my head um, I've been, I was climbing a tree when I was like four years old and the tree branch snapped and I fell out the tree and I properly bashed the back of my head and I still have a little, like I have a little bald spot where the scar is. Um, it was like quite serious. Oh and what I realized that they say, people that have that kind of trauma to the back of the skull have this chain of problems with their upper back and their calves. And it's two areas mm -hmm. that I've always, always had problems with just really? because you don't realize it there's a chain reaction and I don't know the details of what this chain reaction is, but it limits movements in various bits of the spine, which results in having a really stiff upper back um, and uh, really like tight calves and ankles that don't want to dorsiflex. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You had the, you had the shin, the shin surgery. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So a few years ago I'd had my fair share of kind of lower leg problems various sprained ankles. Um, I'd had been diagnosed at one point, I had five tibial stress fractures. So like shin fra uh, fr fractures. Um, and then rehabbed in the gym, doing all my calf rises, all that stuff. Deadlifting crazy amounts to try and jump higher and s safely and got mm -hmm. back. And I felt strong in kind of a compact way, but I definitely felt stiff. I felt like I couldn't move well. Um, and I ended up few years later I was still in quite a lot of pain um, and I'd been doing a lot of research and I thought that I had something called um, chronic exertional compartment syndrome which is basically 
um, the fascia. So uh, all your muscles are connected by this kind of kind of like a cling film, and it runs through the whole body. It connects different muscle groups. Um, my fascia um, was very dense and very thick. Um, and so that was basically compressing groups of muscles in my lower leg so that they couldn't um, pump blood effectively. And so people mm -hmm. talk a lot and Dan say, oh, I can't feel my feet. But when I used to say that, mm -hmm. I genuinely couldn't feel my feet because I couldn't pump oxygen sort of below the knee, uh, which resulted in me having uh, stress fractures in the shin because the fascia is also attached to bone. So the fascia was so compressed and, and tight um, that it was pulling on the shin and gave me the fractures. Um, so eventually we discovered that's what I had and it is what had been causing all my problems. Um, mm -hmm. And in all honesty, knowing what I know now, I don't know if I needed the surgery, but I probably would have needed a good six months working with someone like Helen to readdress my biomechanics. If I was to have readdressed how poor my foot and ankle movement was, and again, because uh -huh. in the ballet world, because I have nice feet and I have strong mm -hmm. feet, I mean, I no kind of medical person that I'd worked with had actually thought to address that I had really, really poor movement and still actually don't have that great. And it's a journey for me. Um, you mean like movement of kind of the, the joint of your, like the functional joint yeah, so, of that area? Or? So the same thing that I um, was talking about, kind of pronation and supination and mm -hmm. how that then uh, informs how well you can um, plantar flex and dorsiflex your feet, which then has an effect on the knee and the hip and it kind of goes on and on and on up the chain. And actually, if I'd been able to work with somebody like Helen really regularly, I think I probably could have changed it enough to not have to have the surgery. Because um, mm -hmm. the surgery is essentially where they, uh, they open you up and they just cut big holes in the fascia to give you space to be able to pump blood. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. you, can, you can loosen that wind up of the fascia by changing your, um, your biomechanics. It's just that really one of the only methods that I've ever discovered that you can truly change your biomechanics and get them closer to kind of um, ordinary is by uh, using the, the wedges and doing stuff that I've done with Helen, the Gary Ward's kind of method. Um, mm -hmm. But sadly, I didn't have, I didn't know enough about it at the time and it just wasn't really an option. Um, mm. So I had the surgery um, and I did notice a big difference after that surgery that I had it freed up a lot of foot and ankle movement already, having the, the fascia decompressed. Mm -hmm. um, but that's when I really, really um, started to dig a bit deeper, because even after the surgery, I was having various kind of problems still. And I mean, I was still dancing. Um, it's just that I, I still wasn't 100% comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm still not quite there yet, but I'm much, much better than I was. Um, yeah, and I, now that I've got this time, I've, I've really, really discovered how um, integral foot and ankle movement is, particularly for dancers. I just, now that I know, now that I've kind of begun to explore and discover all of this stuff, mm -hmm. I find it amazing that, you know, with 33 joints in the feet, we don't spend more time learning how to make them move well and we just we spend time stiffening them up in a, it would be useful in tandem with lots of other things um but yeah to me it's just mind-boggling that you know ballet dancers are not aware, not aware of our feet of, of of how um how intricate the foot and ankle is and um how much work there is to be done to open up movement and how quickly um it starts to affect the body um there's something else um, Gary Ward says, which is, uh, he really believes joints act, muscles react. So a lot of um, Pilates teachers, all that kind of thing, they'll talk about, um, you know, they'll get you on their, your side, you'll bend your knees up and you'll clam. And they're getting mm -hmm. you to really actively turn things on to be able mm -hmm. to do certain movements. And you, ha you have to make this work instead of going, okay, for this movement, that muscle should turn on automatically. So what movement are you missing for your brain to go, okay, I'm doing this movement. This muscle's job is to extend that joint or flex that joint. Why is it not doing it? They just make mm -hmm. you do the movement and you have to send a separate signal to that muscle to go turn on. But then it's not working on that um, automatic on, off, on, off, on, off kind of system that it should do. Because something else might be prohibiting it from doing its natural switch on, switch off. 
Yeah, yes. because, because you've, um, through kind of um, just modern life, um, even people that sit at desks or just repetitive patterns, or you might have had some kind of um, trauma to the area or another area of the body that you might not even be aware of. Um, and you just, again, your body will limit movement there if it feels like it's not safe. Um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you then have to try and get yourself, get the bones into the right position because your your joint position will dictate how well it functions. So actually you need to prioritize putting all the bones in the right place because the bones mm -hmm. move and then the muscles respond in accordance with the bones moving. So uh -huh. the bone, the joint will start to move and then whatever muscle needs to lengthen and the opposite muscle that needs to contract will just start to work really organically and you don't need to force them to work. That's something again, that now that I've started to explore of this, I find it fascinating that there's still people going, you have to make this work. This is, this is sleepy. This isn't working. You need to turn this muscle on. No, you need to put the bones in the right position first and then it will turn on. If that's the muscle that it needs for that movement, it will turn mm -hmm. on by itself but you need to put the bones in the right position first. Mm. Um, mm. Shifting, it, shifting the skeleton. Yeah. I'd say the majority of people are born um, with the same kind of skeletal factory settings, but mm -hmm. obviously through modern life, like, you know, wearing shoes instead of walking barefoot, you do start to lose movement. And that has this kind of trickle effect up the spine. That you, Your feet should be able to hold you up. You shouldn't need to have orthotics to correct your foot posture your feet should be able to hold you up and if they can't hold you up address mm -hmm. what's what movement is missing or what stiffened up or what stopped working in order for mm -hmm. your feet to start doing their job again we wear shoes not to support our feet but to protect them from you know living on the street and you know there's there's dirt on the ground and there's glass and stuff that's dangerous you know for more in terms of things like infections it's not because uh -huh. our feet it's not because our feet are not capable of holding us up all day long they're more than capable that's exactly what they're designed to do so actually when people then come to do rehab and they go to the gym and they're doing things like jump training and they're doing it in trainers i'm just looking going well particularly for ballet dancers you don't jump in trainers and your feet oh. are that's exactly what's connected to the ground so actually mm -hmm. how every little joint inside your foot is moving is going to inform how well you can jump so you need to train that in tandem with your jump training because otherwise mm -hmm. you're really only learning to jump kind of like from the ankle up and the foot movement is really limited it made me think about what you just said about the wearing the shoes and kind of not paying enough attention to how your own foot is designed to hold you up it's kind of like wearing a cast all the time not spending enough time with your actual tissue that's designed to you know support you and hold you up mm. on its own you're getting too comfortable depending on this modern insole mm. or this modern shoe this modern piece of foam um and not spending enough time working with your actual tissue which should be able to support you and hold you up we had a performance i think we were doing macmillan's rites of spring um, and I, again, couldn't feel my feet. But before I had my surgery, I, I could do, if I did five minutes of releves, by then I just couldn't feel my feet. Um, so mm -hmm. we started this piece and I was warm and it was kind of a little, kind of like jumping around and stuff. So like I already, my calves were like fit to burst. I couldn't really feel my feet. And I landed this really little jump and I rolled onto the outside of my foot and I fractured my fifth metatarsal. Mm -hmm. And when I was coming back from that injury, um, I wasn't put in a, a boot or anything like that because it was a really, really tiny fracture. So they said, um, we're gonna let you walk around in trainers, but we're gonna give you an orthotic. Uh -huh. um, so I had kind of a, one of those arch lifter kind of things. Um, and so I kind of learned to walk with this really funny, like really stiff held arch. And I developed this quite serious fear around mm -hmm. letting my arch relax. And again, it's different from letting the ankle roll in and where the heel and the pinky toe come off the floor. But it's just like, I never let my foot really like splat and flatten because I had this, every, everyone told me, you have to strengthen your arch, you have to do all those doming exercises, you have to lift it and keep it, keep it lifting because that's, that's safe. Um, mm -hmm. And this movement of, you know, softening from big toe to heel, that was bad and I shouldn't do that. 
And so even now I catch myself, sometimes when I'm walking, I catch myself with this foot lifting, lifting. lifting. Because I remember yeah. every step I took, I used to think, you can't let that arch drop, you can't let that foot soften, you have to have this tension in the foot all the time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's actually, I think what um, was part of the beginning of me having a lot of shin problems, because my foot was so stiff and it wasn't absorbing any force every time I walked, every time I landed from mm -hmm. a jump, there was no shock absorption from the bottom part of the foot or the ankle, so it was all being put into the shin. Um, and as a result, ended up with five tibial stress fractures because my feet weren't moving. Because mm -hmm. um, I had the, the compartment syndrome thing on both legs, but I only ever had stress fractures on the left, which was the foot that was like totally, totally rigid. Um, mm -hmm. And it's the same kind of thing, I guess, when people have bad backs and they wear those back brace things. And I'm mm -hmm. thinking to myself, but your spine is designed to hold you up. So. Yeah. What's because missing? you become too de too dependent on this brace or this cast. Yeah. Um. Like after, like if you're not spending not uh, not enough time outside the outside the cast working on your core and your back muscles to hold you up to get back to that place where your spine can do its job. Mm. Once the initial injury is like healed. Yeah. Um, and also, I think you kind of yeah. hit the nail on the head there as well about doing core and back work if mm. you have bad back. A lot of the things mm. people say, you know, if you have a bad back, you have to do loads and loads of abdominals, but then you're really, you can end up over biasing one surface of the body and actually you need to get it, get it moving and then work all around. You can't just work one, you know, people say, oh, I'm just going to do eight minute abs and it's going to get rid of my back problems. Hate to break it to you. You have to do, <laughs> because, and this all circles right back to what you're talking about at the beginning, the way that you need to, your joint has, it has, it can flex and pronate and supernate and yeah. it's like it's like ro it's like rotating out it's like the idea of um actively working my turn in to release more of my turn out when my hips yeah. are really tight never occurred to me until you know i see a therapist or a specialist or someone like helen um yeah we spend so much time on glute work trying to turn out turn out turn out and it's like i wind wind the inside of my hip into a not going one direction when actually I need to, in order to access the full range of what my hip can actually naturally do anyways, I have to work yeah. on that turn in and the turn out. And then you have, you have yeah. full you range of motion. Both ways so that you rest in neutral. You know, mm -hmm. if you have access in both directions, you will then, you will rest closer to neutral and then you will have, you'll be able to open and close the joints and access in, in both directions. Sorry, I'm I get very... it's, yeah, hard to shut me up. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about um, perhaps how much of the work that you do um, in your mind-body connection, for example, when you're coming back from an injury or something, do you do like visualization work at all? Or, um, you know, you talked a lot about exercising the brain. How, what are some ways that you kind of, what's happening with your inner dialogue? Um, like in your I brain, could you explain think, it to us a little bit? I think for the most part, knowing what I know now and sort of what I'm trying to continually learn about, I, I think things like visualization are really, um, are really helpful. Um, the only thing I struggled with is that actually, because I've had these problems, particularly on one side of my body for such a long time, even if I tried to visualize doing things well on that side I have this kind of inner inner little monster that I'll be visualizing myself doing something onto that leg and then I see myself like fall over or buckle or because I physically I just I can't I can't process doing it well because I know that physically I'm still not able yet um, mm -hmm. so that comes down to me leaning heavily on um, kind of movement professionals to help me get what I need to be able to do that. I started working with a, a brilliant guy actually during lockdown called David Gray. Um, and I'm working with him to kind of assess a lot of my other problems. So he's given me loads of really cool um, breathing exercises to get my, my rib cage to rest in a better place. Um, and some really cool um, isometric stuff um, for the back of the leg that's kind of responsible for that um, moment just before you land or take off from a jump. Um, so I'm hoping that'll then help. But I use, t preparing for kind of um, performances and stuff, I use a lot of visualization just because also I don't like to get caught up when I'm dancing. I don't like to get caught up thinking about, 
anatomy or uh -huh. specific muscles or I, I much prefer to think about dancing as sensation and I think I have to kind of I try really hard to leave um all the stuff I'm really passionate about about anatomy and the body and how it works I try to kind of leave that at the door when I'm dancing and just let dance be dance and hope and hope that I've done enough work um on my own body and how it works so that it then can all those um, organic functions then come into the studio with me and are there to kind of lend a hand for what I need. But I don't, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about, okay, I need this joint to do this and I need this muscle to respond in this way and I need to move the rib I, I just think it would just become a bit suffocating after a while. So I, mm -hmm. that I just try to think about sensation and connecting those sensations to the music. Um, and I find that's just a much... Um, I think it changes the way you move and I think it gives your dancing a slightly different quality. I think I remember actually saying to her, I think it was maybe you you and Angela, we were watching someone. I think Emma was doing a run of Cinderella mm -hmm. and she did this amazing um, balance. And I went, went off on one of my rants. Said, no, but it's, it's not a balance. It's not because she's staying still, it's because she's still moving. And you know, this kept her extremities were expanding and it was, it was about sensation and it was so mm. spectacularly beautiful. I mean, because she's got that ridiculously beautiful body anyway. Yeah. But she, she's someone that she's super, super tall, but can move at the speed of light. And I think it's because whether consciously or subconsciously, she really works with sensation in relation to the music, which mm -hmm, is why mm -hmm. she never uses that excuse of like, oh, I'm so long, I can't move fast. She moves just as quick as anyone else I've seen um, and always really, really musical. But I think because she works in sensation and kind of seeing what her body's doing as a big picture um, and not getting too caught up about individual muscles i mean maybe that's not how she works at all but that's how it looks that's what it looks me. like um, and she's, she's a perfect example because well not only can you see like the function of her anatomy and her joints and the way that her joints um can access like their full range um mm. and just a really you can visually see it so clearly on emma's body but the way that you just described her balance, it wasn't stagnant. And that's a beautiful mm -hmm. example of what's happening, uh, what should be happening or what things like motion is lotion and mind body connection and the work that you're doing on your brain and understanding your anatomy, your joints, mm -hmm. how they function. And then let, leaving kind of at the door once you've done that technical work to mm -hmm. then work with your sensations. And it's, a, it's something fluid that's happening. And it's like, you can practically see it. Um, that's what I was talking about in the way that you dance as well. You can see like this, it's like fiber optic connection running through your body when something just connects and coordinates. And it's like, it's the, it's the joints moving and the flesh is on top of it, but your brain is directing it all. And it's, mm. and yeah, and a balance that's not stagnant. It's, it's fluid. I mean, you know, it's like our blood is still flowing. Like it's not frozen in place. You yeah. Know? It's a physical impossibility okay. to be totally still. So actually, yeah. if people are think, I mean, I guess maybe for some people it does work to kind of tell themselves to be still when they're balancing. Mm -hmm. But I think that's normally in a kind of a, a controlled, isolated environment when you're at the bar and you've got a hand on the bar and you've got yeah. time to be able to take your position and find, and find your balance. But I think in terms of being able to balance kind of on demand mm -hmm. in a piece of repertoire or performance, if you embrace the fact that you can never truly be still and turn it into a movement, and it might be absolutely minute, but that tiny, tiny sense of movement, I find really helps me be able to balance on demand. Mm. Because if I think about it as a, as a movement rather than a balance, I don't mm. have that pressure of going, oh, I have to stay on demi point, I have to stay on one leg. It's sort of all just, because I'm distracted by the fact that I'm going, okay, I want this to keep moving, I want my leg to keep lifting, I want my rib to keep going, I want my head to keep pulling up. And even if it's, you only really move, you know, this much. Mm -hmm. I find makes all the difference. Be able to, to balance on demand, for lack of a better term. Mm. Okay, well, this is going to cut out in a second. I just, I feel like we could just go on forever. Um, I, or I could listen to you go on forever. Yeah. Um, oh, Barry, this has been so wonderful. Yeah, fun. Um, I see we have this question here. What about the pressure to be musical? Sometimes if I'm less strict about music, I can dance better. I think working with the music, um, that's another, another letting the music kind of flow through you. That's 
how I'm able to like move quicker or slower as I use yeah. music as my guide. I, I yeah, I agree. I kind of I do think about that, but then also if you're sometimes if you're if it's a real if something is particularly quick and it isn't a huge kind of physical challenge to be able to do it at speed, mm -hmm. then I would then just have to I would spend time on my own. Oh, it's from Sean. Hi, Sean. Um, <laughs> If I, I would then just end up working on my own and eliminating the music and really putting the sensations into my body and try and build up the speed on my own and mm. then find a way to connect it to the music. But then also yeah. sometimes things like Neapolitan that are like super, super, super nippy. Sometimes you start and you don't necessarily know what you're going to get from the conductor that day. And there are shows that have been so, so on the edge. And I've been so close to dropping my tambourine or you know, slipping. And actually, if I if I really, really force myself to connect everything I'm doing to the music, it does happen. Maybe you ha might have to cut a movement here or there. But that's just kind of, that's a personal battle about what you want to prioritise and making choices about, okay, actually, maybe I can be a bit late here and catch up and still somehow make it m musical rather than rhythmical. Um, mm. Yeah, that's just part of the ongoing battle of being a dancer. Yeah. Oh, and that's the beauty of the work. The beauty of the yes. work. <laughs> oh, this has been such a treat, Barry. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Thanks for having me. Um.